Are we ready? Are we ready? Are we ready? You're all, you're all uh, hyper on caffeine now after the coffee break. So we are at our last session. We will be looking at the last two parts of two pillars of transformational leadership, and that is Intellectual stimulation, you seem to be very stimulated after coffee. Yeah? Intellectual stimulation and individualized consideration. And then we're going to look at the dynamics that the leader has to deal, whether they focus on the task or they focus on the person and how we can balance these two. Because we want to accomplish a task and we want to preserve a relationship with the people that we interact with. So there's always this dynamic interaction between Accomplishing a task versus maintaining a good relationship with people. These are the four I's so that you will not forget them. Intellectual stimulation is about innovation. And that's why in the video we watched in the morning, we saw two very important innovators in our modern history, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs. They were leaders who intellectually stimulated their teams. If you think that Steve Jobs or Bill Gates invented everything in Apple or in Microsoft, you're wrong. But they created an environment where they continuously encouraged people to be creative and rewarded that creativity all the time. So that is part of being a transformational leader. It is about reaping innovation, creating a workforce that is all the time creating new ideas, being innovative. While we sit together here, and we have a spy from Apple, by the way. <laughs> He's a spy from Apple. While we sit here and we are enjoying uh, iPhone 7, are we? I think iPhone 11 is already in the making. They're always three or four generations ahead, and this is the creative team that is sitting back there creating the next generation of phones. And iPhone 11 may be this big, I don't know, but they are out there. So transformational leadership, it is about recognizing new and daring ideas. It's not about recognizing the normal status quo, business as usual, Sunday school teaching as usual. We have to be creative, innovative as we move forward. It involves self-managed learning. You have to get your members to come to a point where they are no longer satisfied with what they know and they want to continuously build on their learning to move forward. It's not enough that my formal education or my formal training is enough till today. You want to create an environment where people are always asking to learn more, be trained more, get new ideas and be creative in that. It's a continued lifetime education. Intellectual stimulation gets you to a point where as a leader, as a leader, the members that you are working with are all the time aware of the problems. And that's a problem many leaders do. From the first day that you are interacting with a member, they come to you and they say, I have a problem. And our tendency as leaders is to say, don't worry, I have the solution for your problem. And we give them the solution. And what happens in that, every time that member in your team faces a problem, what would they do? They come to you, they come to you because you have the solution. That's the biggest ego problem that the leader has because they want to show their followers that they know the solution, right? They want to show the followers, I know the solution, I have the solution, so I want to give that solution to you. At the same time, you're creating a culture of dependency, where the follower or the member will always come to you to solve the problem, and they no longer become creative. So anytime, from day one, you go back 
to wherever you are coming from, whether at work, at church, at Sunday school, at youth group, whatever. Somebody comes and says, I have a problem. Say, okay, go back and come back and say, what is the solution to that problem? Train people from the beginning to be creative in coming with the problem and an alternative for a solution. Because solutions are ideas. Problems can be viewed negatively. I view problem as an opportunity to create something new. If I don't face a problem, there's no need for us to create a solution for that problem. So leaders should encourage their team even to have creative competition within the team. Now here I'm not talking about fighting it out with team members. I'm talking about getting alternative solutions to the problem, innovative, creative, so that creativity, competition creativity creates even more creativity. But let that creativity or competition be a positive competition rather than a, a clash. So our job is to create a climate of creativity and innovation. And here, in our intellectual stimulation, I don't know why the mouse is in the middle of this. In the middle, while we are trying to create these solutions, we must offer our teams the equal opportunity to get training, workshops, formal education. Never stop at offering that. Offer it to all team members. Team, some will pick it up, some will take advantage of it, some will not use it. Our job is always as transformation leaders to offer equal training and development opportunities to all our team members. Okay? That was the third pillar. Intellectual stimulation, which is about innovation, creativity within the team. The last pillar, the fourth pillar. I think my battery is dying. <laughs> is it? Let's see. or not. I think I should have left the mouse somewhere. Be now it's working. <laughs> Let's complain to Apple. <laughs> now we... <laughs> there you go. That's, that's what, what happens when you try to put a Microsoft program on an Apple computer. <laughs> okay, so we come to the last pillar, individualized consideration. Here, leaders, they cater for, support, coach, and mentor the members' development needs. Now, as I said at the beginning yesterday, this is always a sensitive issue. We are supposed to be fair leaders offering everyone equal opportunity. So how am I supposed to you know, take into account individual needs within the team. Isn't that like a conflict of interest? Isn't that like treating a team member more favorably than another team member? How does that dynamic work within transformation and leadership? Come on. So if we have within the group uh, some individuals that they're not willing to progress or not willing to improve, uh, then we have to use the, with them like different kind of leadership. Uh, those who have like high skill and at the same time high will, we have to use with them like coaching or mentoring uh, rather than directive uh, style exactly. of leadership. We have to realize, thank you, that was very important. We have to realize that while we are all born equal, our skills, our needs are not equal. And each one has a key. And the individual consideration is finding the key for that person. At the same time, maintaining the shared values, the equality among 
the team members. So it's, a, it's quite a sensitive approach. I'll give you some examples, but more from you. How do you think this can work? Fair, equal sharing, yet individual consideration. Watch your head, Milk. I can give an example from my work. Uh, you know, I teach in university. I'm, I'm head of a department. And then, every now and then, I ask people to give lecture or to come and assist me in things. And the question that I face sometimes is whether to give somebody a second chance. I think this is important, because you cannot give chances forever. So he didn't do well, and the evaluation of the student was not very good. But I myself know that this guy can do well. And if I come and do a one-to-one -to -one with him, and tell him the weak point that he has, he may do better the second time. So most of the time, if I want to give a chance for somebody just once, and I tell him this, you, you will have just once, rarely I will do a two times chance. But I, most of the time, I give the, somebody who I'm convinced with, and he has the potential. I, 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 this is my gut, my feeling about him. I, I, I convince the board that we should give this guy a chance after I have the one-to-one -one with him. So this is an issue which I have faced last year, and I think it's a common issue. It's not an uncommon. It's a very important example, and I also I sometimes do it at university. There's a deadline, 10 students, 9 submitted within the deadline, the 10th didn't. And so I emailed them proactively, said the deadline has passed, what is going on? And if they come up with a legitimate excuse, you know, my father is in the hospital, I couldn't... Re I said, okay, 24 hours extension on the deadline, go ahead. And they would see that as the best thing that you have done. Now, I share this with the class because I don't want to do this behind the team members' back. So uh, when we come back, I will share this with the class. I said, one of your colleagues could not meet the deadline because of the situation they faced. So individual consideration is taking that extra step as a proactive leader in order to win over that person. You know what happens with that student? You won them over. You've changed their life. Just because you went one step ahead of what they consider to be the rules and regulations. So individual consideration is a very powerful tool that a transformational leader can use. At the same time, maintaining... How do you react? Ah, good question. Do you believe any person is born uh, lazy? You would say yes. Uh, I would disagree with both of you. <laughs> not in the, yeah, no one here, yeah. We're not, you know, no one here. But, you know, outside here, yeah. No one is born lazy. No one is born without motivation. It is the leader's task to find the right key to motivate them. Do you agree? I do. I personally think that laziness is uh, is the uh, Sorry. Uh, it's like when you sit next to someone who is always sleepy and who is always unmotivated. You become sleepy and unmotivated. You cannot uh, you can be hyper and active and uh, you cannot have the will to work if the people around you are not uh, watching you. So it is contagious yeah. sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> it is contagious. I, all right, so we're back. I, we're going to wrap this up. Yeah, go ahead. But no, I was just going to follow up on your point. I think, I think we're using laziness. Of laziness or demotivated. Yeah, Let's I think we're using laziness in a wrong way. I think it's if you find a person is lazy, it's probably because they're not motivated because you're not using their skill into their full potential. But when you find this, their skills or their way to, that, that motivates them, that's when exactly. you get them more. Exactly. And one of the... One of the uh, the topics that uh, Father Jack and I discussed, other transformational leadership, there's something called motivational leadership. Because again, motivation is a very important technique. As I said, no one is born without motivation. No one wants to live their life without accomplishing anything. However, sometimes you grow in a context where you are demotivated all the time and you're never allowed the opportunity to show all your capacity and all your skills. So individual consideration is the leader's task 
to find the key that starts the engine of the intrinsic drive that makes people excel at their work. Now, this will be different from person to person. So this chart is very important. As a transformational leader, you cannot treat all the people the same all the time. Everybody has a peak performance here. And for you, that peak performance can be three hours a day. For you, it could be two hours a day. So every person has that peak performance. And in individual consideration, what the leader should do is get each one to function at their peak. If they generalize their approach, for some, they would be functioning much below their capacity and performance. And for some, they will be over the maximum. And if you push people over the maximum all the time, they go into burnout. So that's why this point here, maximum performance, is different from one person to another. A person would come to work with you or a volunteer or whatever. And if you say what well, just one kind word to them in the morning, that's enough for a week. That's the maximum performance. Another person who's probably suffering financially, you know, if you just make yourself available, say if you need any financial assistance or anything like that, that individual consideration is the key for a transformational leadership. Keeping in mind that we have to be fair for our team members. So this is always a sensitive point. Where do we stop? Where do we start? Where is that maximum performance? Any questions? So intellectual stimulation, individualized consideration. Having said this, there's always this dynamics when it comes to this. We have a task to accomplish, right? But we have people who are working with us. Where do we focus on the task or when do we focus on the task and when do we focus on relationships? If I was to ask a general question here, who is task oriented? Put your hand up. You know what task oriented is? I, I see the task, I go for it, I accomplish it. Just one? Who's task oriented? You see a task, it's written right there. You're goal oriented, you want to achieve. This is what you see. I am task oriented. I am task oriented. By nature, I am task oriented. So I see the task, I go after it, I want to accomplish it. You prepare a calendar, you Manage your time very carefully. You're very effective in every minute. If you get stuck in traffic, you go crazy because you're <laughs> task-oriented. Look to the last sentence here. Reasons for being comes from doing. Because we're all the time busy with our task. All we see is our task. However, there's another group of people who are people-oriented or relationship-oriented. Here they focus more on relationships with people. They want to connect with people. I know, I know a leader in an organization here. He's, he's, uh, he's an expat. Uh, the employees, if they want to go into his office, they fight who uh, doesn't want to go in there. Now, you may think for the wrong reasons, you know, that he's obnoxious. Actually, he's just too much of a people-oriented that whenever you enter in his office, just to get them to sign a paper, you spend an hour and a half there. <laughs> he's asking all about your family, what you have done over the week, and what have you done, uh, how is things going? He would go for an hour and a half. If I met this guy, if I was in, like, he was in my, in my club, in my sports club, and I would try sometimes to avoid him, sorry to say this, because if I bumped into him, half an hour of my day is gone. So these are people-oriented relationships. Some people are like that. They care more about relationships than about completing a task. So who is people-oriented here? Oh, one, two. Okay, the rest of you, you have to fit somewhere. I mean, you can't be. <laughs> 
Hmm? There you go. You are? You're both. I personally am more task oriented. I train myself to be people oriented. There's nothing wrong with asking about how are you doing? How are things? Not what are you doing? When are you going to get this done? That's task oriented. So the best approach, of course, is to find the mid range. Because if you are completely people oriented, the task will never get done. The task will never get done. And if you're completely task oriented, individualized consideration doesn't exist. You cannot have interaction with your people. You see people as projects. You see people as objects. You see people as numbers, as statistics. You don't see them as individuals who you can succeed with their success. So the best is a balance. Isn't it also possible for some certain cultures like the Chinese? Ah, very important question. Uh, culturally, we can sometimes look at this. Many of you come from the Nordic countries, right? When you first got there or started living there, which culture do you think the Nordic countries are? Hmm? I know it's cold. I mean, task or, <laughs> task or people? Task. I mean, I know many, I have many Nordic friends, and they're always task oriented. They need uh, to put a lot of effort to become people oriented. If you come to Syria or to Lebanon, what culture is that? <laughs> people. In our culture, I don't know. Like, if somebody is saying the visit is over, so we have to go, there, we stand at the door for another half an hour <laughs> that we could have easily sat in the salon and had the discussion. We are people oriented. So it does affect our cultures. Again, we have to do a mixture of both and try to find the right balance. It's very important for a transformational leader to understand their people also. Because if you are a task as a follower or as a member in the team, and you are task oriented and I'm people oriented, oh, we're going to have a hard time working together. <laughs> because you want to enter and have a dialogue with me with task in my mind, in your mind, and I have people. So how are you doing? I'm doing very well. Can you uh, get the, yeah, but how's the, fa what did you do last weekend? Uh, uh, working on this project. <laughs> so, and, and so it becomes a very difficult dynamics to deal with. Transformational leaders should be able to find this, this balance between task orientation. I have a job. I have a task. I want to accomplish it. At the same time, I don't want to step on people while doing it. I keep asked many times, Machiavelli, what did Machiavelli say? The end justifies the mean task oriented completely the end justifies the means completely wrong completely wrong even with business students they say yes but you are accomplishing the goals but you did it on what price what did you do with your team what did you do with the people who work with you they hate you they hate their jobs they're demotivated they just do it because they're scared of you so being task oriented no good being relationship oriented Again, good, but if you take it to the extreme, there's a lot of wasted energy, performance, time, and that is not good for any ministry, for any church, for any organization. So task orientation, it's production oriented. Relationship oriented is looking at the person, and we have to balance these two. Are you ready to do one last exercise today? Yes? But before, we have a few questions. Yeah, we'll start with there. Yeah, let's get the microphone. Latin. Thank you. I think there is a line between being task-oriented and people-oriented is like in your job you have to be professional and uh, you take consideration to your goals uh, you do not socialize in your job then when you are out of the job 
uh, thing then you can socialize and other things so you can be both of them here we have a task oriented person <laughs> <laughs> obviously actually you can be both because you can actually accomplish more if you have good healthy relationships with the team you can accomplish more the issue is always this line where do we draw the line where do we balance this out because if there is a deadline tonight for a project I will have to be task oriented with my team and my team will have to understand our team will have to understand that I have to be task oriented we cannot spend an hour having a coffee break when the deadline is tonight so it really depends on on what you have at hand where the balance shifts so task yes relationships very important to accomplish that task question somebody had their hand up here I think it's communication too like when you give an order to somebody to complete a task if you explain to them why it needs to be completed it uh, probably be worth like it'll exactly. work a lot better exactly and so that builds on the relationship if I don't share why we need to accomplish this task and this deadline within these parameters then that person would simply feel like a number and not as part of the team any more questions about task versus people yeah who's who's balanced here between the two you can put your hand up it's all the ladies I don't know man <laughs> that's <good. laughs> okay no sometimes the, the the good thing about this is it makes you think if you are task oriented that's not bad all you have to do is make a little balance towards people and towards relationship and if you are completely relationship or people oriented it's not bad that's a good trait all you have to do is say yes there are some things that are should be task oriented and I have to keep the focus on that task okay any more questions Are those the only two styles you have, or are there more? That's not uh, a style to have. This is when you are considering individualized cons consideration for the person, you have to keep in mind that there is a balance I have to strike between accomplishing a task and at the same time attending to that person's need. So I have to keep that in mind in my fourth pillar, individualized consideration of transformational leadership. Okay, so that's not a, an overarching style. That is part of that pillar. Last question. So, last exercise we're going to do today, it's about leadership strengths. And uh, you will have a few questions to look at, like usual. You'll share your results with your colleagues, and then we'll move to the last section. Malco, you shouldn't sit there. So the leadership uh, strengths, it's looking at four areas. Some of them are tasks, some of them are people. Executing would be task. Influencing would be people. Relational building, of course, would be people. Strategic thinking would be both. Thirty questions. Thirty questions, thirty seconds per question.
lab viewer. Anybody didn't get the paper questionnaire? Well, Okay, you have a task to finish the 30 questions. For those of you looking at Facebook, that's people-oriented. You focus on the task now. <laughs> Can I see can I see a show of hands how many people have finished? That's it. <laughs> okay, two more minutes. 
Two more minutes. Oh, he's on the second page, okay. Yeah, almost done. One more minute. Forty-five seconds. This is task-oriented. You see, when you go like this, a timer. <laughs> seconds, 29, 28. <laughs> this causes more stress. Okay, time up. Time up. Can we listen to some responses from your colleagues. Hello back there. Time is up. Yo, time is up. You can finish it later and analyze the results. Let's take a sample of some questions. So we cannot do all 30 because we finish at quarter to one. So we're going to take a sample of a few questions. Okay. From the first five questions, set of five questions, uh, who got the five on on any of them. Okay. Microphone. Microphone. Last person who took the microphone didn't return it. Oh, me. Okay. Thank you. Can you share with us? Which question? Read it and why did you put that score? Uh, I want to know. Uh, point, uh, question four. Question four. Yes, I want to know why yes. we are doing what we are doing. Uh, before I actually do something and work and doing, I want to know why it is, uh, why we are working for the problem because the motivation mm -hmm. isn't there if I don't know what it's about. Okay, so question four, which is not on your sheet of paper, but you will get it with the slides. Question four falls under an analytical score. So that personality shows that I need to analyze the questions and I need to understand what is going on before I take the first step. So that's an analytical strength. Let's take the next five questions. Who had scored five on those next five questions? Five? 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 Okay, we're going to go back there. Someone who hasn't shared yet. <laughs> I'll help you. What do you need? They'll help you. Okay, go ahead. Which question? Seven. Seven? I like to explore creative approaches to problems. Okay, and uh, what does that say about your leadership strength? You're an innovator. So that shows a strength in innovation because I always want to look at creative solutions. These will be with you. See, question seven here, you're an innovator. Thank you. Do you want to share something about that? No? That's not very creative. <laughs> okay, questions 11 to 15. Who scored five? Only one, two, three. There you go. You're with us, right? Yes, I am. Also mentally. Uh, 11. Which question uh, 11. Yes, I stick with the task until the work is completed. I stick with the task until the work is completed. I stick with it until the work is done. This shows you're an implementer person. N no. And implementers are important, but yes. sometimes they're too task oriented and they want to do everything themselves. My wife has the tendency to do this. When somebody comes to her and says, I'm unable to do it, don't worry, I'll do it. 
<laughs> I'll do it. I'll, okay, you can do certain things enough, but then you can't do everything. So implementers have the tendency to always do what other people can easily do. Okay? okay. Questions 16 through 20. Who scored five? <laughs> you scored five on everything. We're going to go with you, then no for sharing around. Uh, I scored five for 16 and 17. Uh, I enjoy creating uh, a vision for a work related to a project. Um, I always do a plan for everything that I have to do. Especially if it's a project with a deadline, I always calculate the time I need for doing the steps of the project. I cannot finish without doing this because everything goes up uh, uh, strangely and uh, doesn't finish well if I don't do that. That's important. I mean, that's an innovator and innovators usually are not very good in scheduling their <coughs> timeline. So that's very important skill to have. That's very good. Questions 21 through 25. Who scored five? Okay. We're going to hear your voice. Go ahead. Uh, so 21, I like making to-do lists so that the work gets completed. <laughs> yes, very much me. <laughs> um, I like to have a goal in mind. And to reach that goal, I constantly have to do to-do lists to make sure that a to-do list, you know what a to-do list? That's an implementer, for sure. Because you do a to-do list, and you want to make sure that you are implementing everything on the to-do list. I have news for implementers. For those who have to-do lists, for other people, they have to do a not-to-do list. <laughs> because sometimes your to-do list puts so much tasks on you, and it becomes stressful. And sometimes you have to say, these are some issues that I really do not need to do. Somebody else can do them. And the implementer can slowly gain more relationships and people. Good point. Last set of questions, 26 to 30. Who scored five and who would like to share those with us? I, uh, uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Both of you will talk. Don't worry about it. We can spare a minute. No problem. Lunch can be late a minute. No problem. I picked 26. I enjoy scheduling and coordinating activities so that work is completed. Uh, again, implementer, yes. yes. Yeah, pretty much me. I, like I said, I work with the youth, and we plan retreats like this, and I break our schedule into like minutes. <laughs> All right. Good time management skills. Last one. Um, well, I had, I think I had a lot of fives, as you said, mm -hmm. but um, I will take number thirty. I am effective at helping coworkers reach uh, consciousness. So uh, when we have problems at work or they are so stressed and they start freaking out, um, I tend to take things like calm me. Okay. It's just a stressful situation. Take it easy. Everything is going to be okay. It's not the, le the end of the world. Um, take it step by step and so on. Okay. So make them like come out of that stress That's situation. That's a mediator strength. That's a mediator strength. I was waiting for someone to talk about that. Because out of all these leadership strengths, we need them all. What you need to do when you analyze your scores later is find out if you only have like implementer you need to work on other areas of strengths, like a mediator. Make sure that people are doing the best that they can. Can I ask who got five, score five on questions three? No one? Three. Yes? Did you get a five on question three? Hmm? No, I'm just asking about question three. You got it? Share with us, because that's an area of an encourager. That's a people-oriented person. Let's listen to the question three. I am good at encouraging coworkers when they feel frustrated about their work. Is this task or people? Completely. An encourager. 
And so again, this exercise of 30 questions will allow you to find out where you have areas of strength that come naturally to you and where are areas that you will need to work on and develop in order to have a good balanced leadership style. You have a question? You need to hear this. We have here a task-oriented implementer person who wants to share his opinion. Go ahead. I had a terrible experience with some nurse. She was more interested of her nails than her job. <laughs> so, <laughs> and that was killing me. <laughs> you need to find the key, my friend. Yeah, but she got fired. This she got key. fired. <laughs> <laughs> he gave her the key to the door to leave. That's what he did. No, I said find her key, not give her the key to leave. No. <laughs> All right. Last question. I am interested in who has five on question 28? Who has five on question 28? You have five on everything. No. <laughs> oh my, you too. Yes. Okay, so. Look how many, look. So choose one. So there's something I want to give you, uh, like to take home with you. So imagine SYGG is a project, okay? So if you're good in encouraging people to participate on a project. Get so married to him. No. 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 <laughs> I already found. <laughs> I already found the love of my life. All right, yeah. okay. <laughs> Uh, so I encourage the people for next year's SYGG to come back with you. Yes. Excellent. Would that <laughs> Anybody would like to comment on question 28? No? Thank you for that. Yes? No, 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 not on him. On the question. Yes, on the question. Yes. <laughs> so one, one possibility to do that is to make a, a kind of, of uh, to present what we have done here in your community. Yes. So really just it's two hours that you make a presentation, you show a few pictures. For sure the people will help you to, to make a short video or something. Show that video with the good music, explain which, uh, who you, you, you met here and then, then uh, people will come. You become ambassadors for this group and you become the ambassadors of this project. All right, we're going to watch one more movie, short movie about leadership. It's a funny thing. It's not done for leadership. It's done as a commercial, but it shows how a group of people should be working together. It's very short, so pay attention. This is just a funny way to depict the different strengths. Each leader of these ant groups or penguin had a different approach. One was an implementer, was 
one was instructing, rarely are the in, they're encouraged. But it gives you an idea that you have strengths in some areas, they come natural to you, you would have to work on some areas that does not come naturally to you. Okay? So, we are about to finish. I want to come back to uh, our spiritual part. We said Jesus invested in his people, Jesus organized his people, and the third and final point is Jesus never gives up on people. And here I'm talking in the present verb. It's not Jesus never gave up on his people. Jesus never gives up on people. If we look at the lessons from this leadership model, Jesus Christ, who invested three years of his life equipping, empowering people, organized them. When the tough times came, what happened? He had a 25% Failure ratio. Twelve apostles that I've trained, taught, lived with. They've seen me. I've worked with. I've done everything possible to them. The last day, what happens? 25%. I call them the 3D perspective. Disloyalty, denial, and doubt. 25%, 3 out of 12. Disloyalty. After three years of being the loyal service as the treasurer, Judas decides to become disloyal to the leader and betrays him with 30 pieces of silver. Love of money is the root of many evils. Denial. Peter, so excited to be with Jesus. I will never leave you. And is really in his attempt not to leave Jesus goes very close to danger and then being confront, confronted with what he should do or what to say he denies. Jesus, three times. Not once, not twice, three times. Doubt. Thomas didn't even believe the ten apostles when they told him, we saw him, he was here, he was alive. He didn't believe his team members. Not only did he doubt his master, he doubted his team. And even went to the cognitive level to say, if I do not put my finger on his wounds, I will not believe it. So spiritually he was blocked and he wanted to address this from a completely cognitive approach. High standards of evidence were now required to believe the leader or to walk with the leader. 25%. When I give the statistics to people, I say, and you worry about one person leaving your company after a year or so. <laughs> Jesus invested his life with these apostles, yet he faced 25%. Yet, Jesus tempted to reconcile with every one of these three. Malco mentioned something before about his students. He said, I would like to give them a second chance. Our entire Christian life is about Jesus giving us a second chance. And Jesus here, he is the master. He is the Lord. He is without sin, yet goes down to the level of his failed teammates and reconciles with them. With Peter, Jesus reinstates him with confidence, asking him three times, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? As if to say, you denied me three times. Now I am reinstating you three times. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And as a result of that, Peter becomes the outspoken person who in one sermon brings 3,000 people Thomas, doubting, Jesus comes to his cognitive level, appearing before him. What did Jesus say? Shame on you, Thomas. No, he says, come. You asked to touch my wounds. Come, touch them. What does Thomas say? 
my Lord and my God. You come to people's level. As a leader, you have to go to and attend to people's needs and level. You don't sit up there. You go to their level. That's their level. You have to attend to their level. And it is my belief that Judas, had he not rushed off and taken his own life, it is my belief that Jesus would have reconciled even with Judas. But sometimes we rush, we don't allow God to reconcile with us, and we take the extreme. And many of us have done that, many of us have seen that. This is the lesson today about transformational leadership. Reconciliation is possible. Even within companies where we have to fire people, my friend, reconciliation is possible. When you give people a second chance, the right second chance, you win them over for life. St. Thomas went all the way to India, spreading the word. Peter even refused to die on a cross. He wanted the cross to be upside down. That's what happens when you reconcile with people. Never, never give up on people. Jesus was able to transform Peter's denial into this champion of his mission. And Thomas' doubtful attitude into evidenced proof, and so on and so on. So our third lesson and final lesson from the leader today is never give up on people. If he wasn't willing to give up on his people, those who had failed him after three years, we should not be more royal than the king himself. When your people see you as a cause instead of an effect, it would be easy to teach them to think the same way. If you are a cause, people will follow you. If you are an effect, if you are a reaction, people will see you as a reaction. Always be proactive in everything that you do. He never gives up on people, neither should we. You want to? And I end with this. Thank you. Uh, how was it? Well, uh, Dr. Mike, thank you so much. Uh, may God bless you. The recognition, you. Uh, the recognition is not from us. It's from, uh, from God, who is in heaven. Um, uh, what we, uh, we can do is to announce that um, we might continue with this program in our SYGG. Not only the transformational uh, leadership, but, but also we take all the five or six steps uh, year by year, mm -hmm. or maybe we do something else. We don't know. We leave it to to the surprises, you know. Thank you so much, and uh, on behalf of.